Start trading crypto today. Sign up for our step-by-step video series to get set up with the best trading tools, start analyzing charts, enter and exit a trade properly, and most importantly, see if crypto trading is right for you. Join us at bitlabacademy.com. Welcome to Rice TVX. You've just tuned in for the newest episode of the Rice Crypto Show. And today I am joined by Waters Above. I invited him on so that we can learn more about him, his YouTube channel, how he's combining technical analysis with gematria, numerology, astrology, and diving into the world of the esoteric. Before we get into it, visit ricetvx.com and sign up for my mailing list so you never miss an update or new Rice TVX content. You will also find my various social media links and more. You can also find Rice TVX on Odyssey and Library, where I have a full catalog of my videos, post up extra content, and share other appearances. And you can also find Rice TVX on BitChute. I will include links in the video description for everything I just mentioned, as well as everything shared on today's video. Okay, joining me on today's show is the host of Waters Above. I just I guess I'm just going to call you Waters. Uh, welcome to the show, Waters. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, and I'm definitely looking forward to the conversation. And uh, I to lay a little groundwork for people, uh, I, I've done some collaborations with Donut Factory. You've been on Donut's channel numerous times and have had some great discussions. So I asked uh, Alex if he would connect the two of us, and here we are, and I'm definitely looking forward to the conversation, man. Yeah, shout out to Donut as well. Thanks for uh, bringing us together, and it's amazing to have this unity at this time like we were talking about before we got started. Yeah, and I, and I really do appreciate you know the little conversation we had before we got started, and definitely looking forward to learning more about you, your channel, and what you're doing, and then kind of pick your brain and kind of go over some things that you've been talking about and some questions that I have. But before we begin, I'll let everybody know everything we talked about or talk about is going to be linked down below in the video description. But for people who might be unfamiliar with who you are, do you mind kind of introducing yourself? Yeah, of course. So um, I started my channel around year and a half, almost two years ago. Initially, I actually was working with private clients, people that I was helping build portfolios and develop their own investment thesis, kind of helping them out with their uh, financial situation in that regard. Um, I'm not a financial advisor, but I was helping out people um, before this bull run kicked in uh, back in you know the fall time of 2020. And it really helped me to develop my own strategies and develop my own form of analyzing this market. So I essentially created my own way of combining technical analysis, looking at the charts and um, combining that with gematria, numerology and astrology. I had that course released uh, before I even made my channel. And then my private clients started kind of like pushing me to make to do YouTube and I gave it a shot. And, you know, here we are. But that's that's the bulk of uh, my work and my YouTube videos and, and any content on my Patreon as well as I do a live stream every week where I don't talk about crypto. I talk about more things dealing with consciousness and just this reality, this this simulacrum matrix, whatever you want to call it. But that's really uh, where I'm interested in the most. And that base knowledge and foundation helped me a lot when I started developing my own systems for analyzing the crypto market. That makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that we were talking about a little bit privately before we started recording that I kind of want to resurface on is I was asking you when I when I first found out about you as a content creator as having a YouTube channel it was waters above crypto and now I'm seeing waters above not really with crypto in the title even your website I believe is mm-hmm. watersabove.com so and you did mention that you're doing the live stream that's non crypto related what made you one choose the name waters above whether it was waters above crypto or just waters above. And then why did you shed the crypto ultimately? Yeah. So um, I actually got the name waters above from Genesis in the Bible. 
Uh, it's from the very early part of the Bible in Genesis where it talks about the firmament and, um, you know, the heaven being what's above the firmament or the firmament itself and discussing how there is this separation of the waters above from the waters below and the waters above being the kind of, you know, idea, etheric idea of what heaven is. So it's actually coming from uh, that. That is the origin of my name. And initially I was talking uh, about crypto predominantly in all of my work. Like I told you earlier, I was developing that course and really sticking to the crypto conversation while we were in that bull run. But then I was doing these weekend or these uh, Friday live streams and getting a lot of activity, hundreds of people joining. And it was really the emails I was receiving after the live streams of just the gratitude and the people saying how, you know, I was becoming part of their spiritual journey or their conscious journey. And the way that they were looking at this reality started to shift and become more positive. And, you know, that really, really uh, woke me up actually to the power that this platform has and what I'm capable of doing if I don't just talk about cryptocurrency. So it made me actually take a step back to self-reflect and ask myself, you know, I believe there's a bigger mission here that I could serve. There's a bigger purpose. And in order for me to serve that, I need to be very clear in my mission statement. And I made this pivot uh, actually just in the start of September. So <laughs> here we are okay. in the same month. Uh, I made this rebrand while I launched a new course called the Expansion Mastermind. Uh, it's a course available on my website, watersabove.com. And this course does not talk about cryptocurrency at all. Um, it's kind of like my this, this one here. Exactly. Yeah. So it was like my idea of creating a coaching course that somebody could follow a step by step protocol and learn some of these things that I discuss on my Friday live streams, but in a practical sense and in a way that it has utility, you know, to simplify and expedite people's process through whatever um, this expansion is, is what I like to call it, because I look at it as a very, you know, I, I look at the world right now, especially over the past two years, and I don't want to veer too off, off course, but I look at the world right now kind of in this contraction phase where there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of drama, a lot of theatrics, a lot of narratives kind of embedding themselves into people's uh, reality. And some are just stronger than others, and some are seeking something that is bigger than just being caught up in the news or whatever fear narrative that's being pushed. So anyways, getting back on track, um, I launched that course in the beginning of September along with the rebrand and it's taken a new direction and I absolutely resonate with it more and it's really fulfilling. Okay, no, that's cool. I get that I, and I appreciate you explaining. And as you were telling me a little bit about it earlier, I was like, stop, because I want to ask you in, in, in the actual recording, and one of the things that I was going to ask further is, and maybe this is on the table, I'm not sure, but because it's actually on the table for me, have you thought about starting like a, a separate channel, like a sister channel that was not crypto focused, but dealt with all the other topics, the gematria, the numerology and astrology? Yeah, I've gotten a lot of people that have brought that idea up to me, but one of the things that I've learned in my life um, is to simplify your life. If you want to make your life better, simplify it. And I'm really interested in studying business and studying, you know, the growth of companies and just how that whole process works. And it's very natural for somebody in the early stages of their brand or whatever it is that they're creating to want to be like, I'll just say it's like shiny object syndrome. And I've really learned how to step back at those moments where I had that urge to want to do stuff like that and just ask myself, if I could do one thing, it should be done at 110% with 100% unapologetic, ruthless delivery. And here we are. This is what Waters Above should have always been. It's just because of the environment of that crypto bull run, that was why I prioritized it then. But okay. if this was launched in 2019, I guarantee you it would have just been Waters Above. <laughs> that makes sense. It does. And so for me, like when I started my channel, originally uh, my first video came out January of 2018 and my brand was Rice Crypto. The channel was called Rice Crypto. And, and it was March of 2020 that I started to restructure and add in extra elements, which be became the Stranger Than Fiction stuff, which is... On the, if we weren't talking about crypto, what we would be talking about would be in that category of my shows on my channel. I have three different shows now. 
and then I rebrand it from Rice Crypto to Rice TVX because I wasn't just doing crypto. Now that I've been doing the restructure for about two years with having the Rice Crypto Show for crypto and blockchain, the Rice Report for economics, politics, and current events, and then Stranger Than Fiction for the other stuff, now I'm getting to a point where I'm thinking to start another channel for the Stranger Than Fiction kind of content because I'm doing this full time and I don't have courses and consultation services that I can offer. So I don't need to have the crypto content is what helps me to do this full time. And the stranger than fiction content is the stuff that's controversial that gets me problems with censorship, shadow banning strikes, mm -hmm. et cetera. So I figure for a business move and it, it's going to be more work on my end, mm -hmm. but I'm looking to bring on uh, a, a, another individual or two or maybe a few more uh, to help out with the team. And then I plan on doing that. So I'm just kind of gearing myself up mentally for preparing for this, but there's no way I could give a hundred percent on two channels doing this by myself and be consistent. If otherwise the other channel would, I really wouldn't care about the algorithm mm -hmm. or focus on any of those kind of things where I would need to with the crypto stuff. It was kind of a tangent, but it kind of parallels a little bit with what you were saying. Yeah. No, I mean, you just got to know how to pivot in a way that works for you, right? Yeah. Yeah, true. So when and why did you ultimately get involved in crypto? That's a, that's a really great question. The timeline is a lot longer than how active I've been, to be completely honest. I've known about crypto for quite a while, probably learned about it in like 2017, 2018. Okay. But, and I'm happy that I did not get involved then <laughs> because it probably would have been the same instance as a majority of who got involved in this recent run where they waited till you know like april may to jump in um so i'm glad that i kind of asked myself well i'll i'll say this to start out i'm very patient and i'm good at taking a lot of time to study and research something before just moving into it so what was going on in my life back then in 2017 2018 it was just too much involvement and my attention was somewhere else and i couldn't put it towards crypto so what happened was i was running um, a couple e-commerce drop shipping stores back in 2020 and then the pandemic happened and i had to take a little break from those stores because it was involving you know logistical ish it had some logistical problems so it allowed me to actually utilize that time for something new. And because I was aware of blockchain technology and where this was moving regarding the entire economy, the global economy as a whole, uh, I knew crypto fit into that conversation. Maybe I wasn't aware of the exact time of when it would fit in, but I was, I was enticed by what was going on. And I was teaching myself technical uh, analysis at the time. And I was seeing across the board, the entire cryptocurrency market was oversold. It was bear bear market bottom kind of vibes so for me um i just added one and one together and i had my result and it was this desire to self-teach myself technical analysis and to not necessarily market myself but i had a way of showing people like in my in my personal life guys like this market is something you want to kind of take advantage of now and it's so low that you don't need to risk a lot you could be very conservative for your results and uh, that was what built those private relationships with people that i was helping build their portfolios etc and um, it just kind of all unfolded it all unfolded from there so i've been aware of crypto uh, probably since the last bull run like the 2017 2018 time frame but my involvement as an active investor and as an educator in the space really started in the year of 2020 uh, so 2020 is when you purchased your first crypto? Yeah, that was when I started actively uh, flipping profits from my e-commerce stores into the crypto market because I had no other choice. Like, I mean, I lost everything. I had to make a move. And for me, the only thing that I saw, and perhaps I was a little tunnel vision, but I ended up being correct on my uh, analysis. Um, but yeah, it was pretty much me just going for the Hail Mary pass. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get it. I totally do. Um what was Bitcoin the first cryptocurrency you bought? Yeah, it was um it was Bitcoin and XRP almost in equal amounts and I dollar cost averaged probably every single week until we hit to um I remember this moment very, very well. It was at the start of Rosh Hashanah of twenty twenty. 
I'll never forget it because we pushed up in Bitcoin a little bit before it. And then we cratered right back down to support right around the start of Rosh Hashanah. And then we just went parabolic. And the reason I remember it so well is because I was sharing a technical call out of uh, something called the Wyckoff method uh, developed by Richard. Yeah. So I was, uh, that's how my mastermind course starts out. I'm teaching people the basics of the Wyckoff method and kind of saving people a lot of time with that methodology comparing everything else and, and, and adding accordingly. But I remember that time so thoroughly because we pushed up the way we did and we came right back down to support. And I was telling people in the course, this is called the SOS, which leads to the backup phase. And the backup phase is the last opportunity before we go parabolic. And I went in very heavy around that time frame, And, uh, you know, it was like, it changed my life. I was looking up an article to try to share for a little bit of information with the Wyckoff. So if people are unfamiliar and then I'll let people know again, it, this stuff will be linked down below if they want to. Yeah. And then also if they're interested in taking your course, they can get some information about it as well. Yeah. I really appreciate any support. Yeah. Um, so my course is focused on using Wyckoff method because I think it's the quickest, it's the most efficient and simple beginner level but also could work all the way up to the advanced level you could be using this for time horizons that are three month time horizons all the way down to the 15 minute chart and of course when you're learning ta and you're learning the charts the biggest problem that most people have and perhaps you could uh maybe agree on this is when people open a chart they have no idea where they're at in the chart they don't know what the next move is so right, what I, phase we're in i call wyckoff method the market compass and you could use this for indices, precious metals, you know, and crypto. And I was seeing it work clear as day in the Bitcoin chart. And in my work, I've kind of exposed how, and, and this should be pretty obvious by now, but I got a lot of pushback in the early days of my channel on this idea that Bitcoin is the energy of the market. It's essentially the power, it's the power plant of the market. And if you just isolate Bitcoin, XRP, and Ethereum, you're going to be able to actually see what's going on holistically across the board. And of course, you could add in other things such as uh, tether dominance, and you could be looking at the total market cap charts and do some TA on that. You could be looking at Bitcoin dominance. That tells you a lot of the story as well. But to simplify things, I just launched my course and, and planned it out in a way that allowed complete beginners, like people who have no idea even what's going on, to allow them to know where they are when they load up a chart. And that's the big missing piece to people who are talking negatively about crypto or talking negatively about um, technical analysis. I mean, how many times have you heard people say technical analysis doesn't work or trading doesn't work? or this doesn't work, but those people, they can't articulate anything about what allegedly doesn't work. So well, it's like, really if you're successful and they're, and they're saying it doesn't work as a, a way of trying to make themselves not feel bad about being a bad right. trader. But right. <laughs> it's like, if your car broke down and you say it doesn't work and you don't want to like, you're adamant about what's going on. But if you were a mechanic, you're like, yeah, it does work. You just got to do this one thing and we'll solve the problem very quickly. Exactly. So the method to the madness uh, is to simplify something that is very dramatic, very volatile, which the crypto market is clear, very, very dramatic, very, very volatile. And uh, there's cheat codes and those cheat codes are Wyckoff method and combining it with this more esoteric perspective. Now, interestingly enough, um, I, like when people talk, when I first heard the Fibonacci uh, being used uh, in, in tra trading and looking at different levels where things can go up and down that's kind of almost in that realm of esoteric knowledge um when i think about it but then kind of adding in the elements that you're talking about is very unique uh, i know some people that obviously are using like astrology and things like that but i haven't heard of all three what made you decide to use gematria numerology and astrology and i guess were you into that like prior like way prior to mm -hmm. crypto yeah exactly so i was very interested specifically in numerology and etymology and etymology just, i love etymology yeah so those were two things that i already had a lot of base knowledge in and 
my work on astrology isn't from the typical lenses of an astrologer. It's actually in a very simple format. And I found a couple of basic things throughout my work that, again, it just simplifies things for people because that is what we should all be doing for, for, for anyone, giving somebody a simple version. Of course, there's a more complex uh, application here, but it's already complicated to learn TA and it's very complicated to learn how to decode using Gamatria. So my work has always been about thinking about brand new people and getting them into it in a way where they feel comfortable and, it, and it's accessible, even though it's very esoteric and quite complex. So yes, I had a lot of experience in that. The Gamatria uh, conversation actually aligns very similarly with the timeline of when I got into crypto as an active investor. Um, but that's part of the etymology, numerology background. You know, you kind of naturally find yourself landing in this space where you see that there's a significance between numbers and letters, right? And that's essentially all gematria is. It's a numerological cipher, and there's many forms of that, but it's taking the letters and giving it a numerical value. And when you add this all up, you end up with a total value of the sum of the word. And you start to see that there's a significance between words connecting to each other. So if I was to know your full birth name and your mother's full birth name and the town you were born and the date you were born on, I don't even need to know your astrology markers. I could just decode you using Gamatria. So getting back to what's happening here with my work, what I discovered, and this comes from more research and knowledge in mythology, was I noticed that cryptocurrency was given mythological, you know, like deities, if you will, where Bitcoin was created by Satoshi Nakamoto and Satoshi is Saturn. And you start to see there's connections to certain coins with certain mythologies, such as XRP has a direct tie to Jupiter. There's coins that have direct tie to Venus, to Mars, to Mercury, Pluto, Neptune, etc. So I started to actually create my own my own system. And I shared that system with the world with this channel of combining the mythology and the mythological story that you get with the actual, you know, these uh, Greco-Roman mythologies specifically. I do get a little bit into Egyptian and Babylonian Canaanite if I need to. But again, to keep it simple, everything that's happening in our realm is coming back to those mythologies. The reason why the court system is set up the way that it's set up, why the judge wears the black robe, all of this stuff is coming back to mythology and very few people are aware of it, but there's been great teachers of our time that have exposed this, such as Jordan Maxwell. And I mean, there's plenty of them that have shown the Saturn, the Saturn cult vibes of our realm. And think about money, right? Money is tied to a couple of these uh, mythological characters, such as Mercury. Moneta. Exactly. Moneta, Juno. So once you start to see that and you see it playing itself out in our in our real world, then it's no longer conspiracy. You know, it's, it is what it is. The symbolism that you're getting on the back of the dollar bill, the owl in the corner. I mean, all of this stuff, it goes back to these, these origin stories of the mythologies. Yeah, no, I mean, I've heard a lot of that and I've seen some of that in research. And then when you mentioned things about Satoshi Saturn, and uh, when you just spoke about the court system, it definitely reminded me of, of Jordan Maxwell, rest in peace. Um, definitely a fan of his work. Me and Donut did a little bit of a tribute episode talking about him as well. So yeah, I appreciate his work and I'm glad that Donut got to talk to him a little bit about some of the cryptocurrency aspects, especially one that I do want to get into here in just a little while is about XRP and the water aspect because that interplays too kind of with the law. Mm -hmm. but, but what ultimately made you decide that you want to, to combine that those worlds and put that together versus just doing TA or just doing just straight gematria. Mm -hmm. What made you want to try to combine all of that together with waters above? Well, because it's more holistic. It's like knowing about the way the body works. If you only think about nutrition and you disregard, you know, physical exercise, you're leaving out a huge component of what's happening here. So with my work of just getting into the Hebrew calendar and talking to people about the seven year sabbatical cycle, the Shemitah, that has been life changing for people and opening up their eyes to what's really going on here for timing the market. So with my work, I don't really focus on predicting or trying to time the market necessarily, but we've been pretty damn good at doing such. Okay. And it's because of these more esoteric components. When you just have TA, it's very difficult. 
when you just have the gematria and the decoding application, it's going to be very difficult to know what prices we hit. So by combining the two, I have a timing element, plus I have a levels element. I can know where my supports and my resistances are. I know where to set my limit orders, where to set my trades up. I mean, I could really make a system that's so holistic that it actually it covers all of those missing pieces that typically I think, you know, people wanted answers to people right. really wanted answers to this stuff. And that was what excited me and motivated me to put in this work and, and share it with the world. Now, just on a personal level, I mean, not that you, that you incorporated it all with your work. Do you watch any other um, traders, technical analysis people that, that just go straight TA? I actually, I'm glad you asked that because a lot of people ask me that during my live streams. I don't anymore. I probably stopped watching TA analysts. Um, oh man, probably like a year and a couple months ago. Yeah, okay. I have no desire. And it's not, but I respect them. I think a lot, I think there are some incredible analysts out there that do amazing work. But for me, I have a background in, in uh, music. I'm a musician and I love okay. making music and and there's a element to being a musician where you could be very influenced by people who play the same genre that you're into and uh that just comes from that side of me where i love making unique sounding music and i learned when i stepped away from listening to the same genre that i play for instance if i was to listen to like salsa piano from like a band back in the 80s right i'm gonna get an element that i could add into my music that wasn't there and that has like this beautiful like kind of excitement for me so I wanted to do the same thing with this work. I, I do follow a decoder, though. Um, his name is uh, Decode Your Reality, Logan. I follow his work. Um, it's super influential for the more esoteric components of my work um, regarding the decoding side of things. But as for technical analysis, no, I don't watch anyone. Now, with the decoding, it has nothing to do with cryptocurrency, though, does it? Um, he might have decoded stuff in the past regarding crypto. I'm sure he has. But, but it's not a focus. No, it's definitely not a focus. And what I like about it so much is it's including things that I think have given my work even more value and more merit to some of the theories that I had. It's actually become solidified and took theories that I had and brought them to life, such as the periodic table and using uh, that periodic table has really, really helped me with I don't want to use the word prove, but let's just say to prove the connection between certain mythologies and the actual cryptos. Okay. No, that's interesting. I, I find it very fascinating. I mean, and you've, a lot of things that you said have made a lot of sense. Now, you, you kind of touched on the astrology aspect about you not looking at any specific, because I know there's different types of astrologies. Correct. Same thing with numerology. Is there, and I guess I'll go in reverse order, but, and I want to ask about Dramatria because you did talk about the etymology aspect that I want to get into, but with numerology, is there a specific type of numerology that you utilize? Um, well, I've been, since doing this crypto work, I found a lot of uh, merit in the Chaldean numerology. So that's easy to find on that Gamatronator calculator that you had pulled up before. Okay. Um, Cal the Chaldeans and their civilization is just super fascinating. I mean, there's some of the they are the origin of astronomy and uh, astrology in in that particular regard, not necessarily talking about the components tied to mythology, but that is a form of numerology that I find really fascinating. Um, outside of that, I'm okay with using the typical form of numerology where you take any double digits and you round them or you just reduce them. That's completely fine. But when anyone sees my work, they're going to see that I don't reduce down my dates when I'm talking about significant dates that I'm finding from uh, looking at the uh, just basically looking at the numerology itself. So, for instance, if you get the number 15, typically in, in numerology, you're going to reduce that down to one plus five equals six. In my work, I would leave it at 15 and I'll show you all the connections to the number 15. And that's where we really can hone in. I'll start bringing it into different calendar systems, different mythologies, different connections to different coins, and um, also different world events, because the world events are happening on the world stage specifically for a reason on those timelines and in those years. Everything happens because of a ripple effect of time. No, that's very fascinating, because I did an interview with uh, Jason Brashears from Archaics, and he does some really interesting research involving isotropical isotropal years if i'm saying it right with a common center point year and i'm not sure exactly how these years are determined right. but he's saying that basically 
for example, he said 1998 was the last year that could be utilized for this. But if you go 10 years back from 98 and then 10 years forward from 98, you should see corresponding things happening in those time frames. Like correct that are that parallel one another. So one, so he even had some predictions based off that where um, Nixon was the uh, first, well, w the last president that was taken out of office um, in midterm. Mm -hmm. And he's predicting the same thing will happen this year uh, based off of, of that isotope topical. It's very interesting, very fascinating. So I'm, when you're dealing with cycles, because you mentioned the Jewish calendar, the Shemitah, um, the gematria, and I hope, you know, I know I was like, how is, am I saying it correctly? Because I know it's like you mentioned a tomato, tomato word. You're saying it perfectly fine. It from I've always understood stood it from coming from like Jewish mysticism from, mm -hmm. and I like to try to use the correct pronunciation, but the, the Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. And then I've heard there's different forms of gematria. Correct. Can you kind of give me a crash course on just gem the gematria that there is, like is available and the type that you use and why? Right. So there will definitely be an origin to this story where it comes back to Greek isopsophy and Hebrew gematria. So when you're doing gematria in Hebrew, you must be using the Hebrew cal uh, characters. And the principles of what they add up to are still the same, no matter if you're using Greek or English or Spanish or anything else. You just need to be finding connections uh, overall, and they need to have some sort of confluence with each other. So to give people a crash, a crash course on the origins of gematria, it goes back to Greek isopsophy, which was their format of taking the Greek letters and applying them to the numbers. And then you have with the Hebrew, it's the same story. And you start to see the significant uh, the significance behind numbers. And anyone has probably heard of angel numbers before or master numbers or power numbers like the number 333 or 444 and them having uh, power to them. So what I started to see was that there is an influence here on the language and the code, if you will, of Gematria and how it plays itself out through certain significance whether it be big events that happen or it be the outcome of certain things or change of power and uh, fall of empires. I mean, you could just keep naming it. So when you talked about the Nixon thing, that's actually something that I found in my work quite a, a while ago. And it was the comparison of the Shemitah that happened in that time frame. And uh, what I was calling Jubilee that happened back at that time frame. So if you look into the market, you had the Nixon shock happen in 1971. Then yep. you had him being taken out of office. And then you have the 1973 to 1975 recession. It was a mini recession. And I've been using Gamatria this entire time, along with the numerological significance behind the seven year cycle, which is called the Shemitah, also practiced in the Hebrew calendar. And combining that all with the gematria in any key terms I could find. So a significant number that we've been seeing a lot happening this year has been the number 14 and the number 15. And those two numbers have been playing themselves out throughout the entirety of this year, whether it comes back to events, uh, uh, outcomes of certain sports events or uh, locations of certain things happening in. It's super fascinating stuff. I mean, it's hard to break down all the nuances, but needless to say, um, the Hebrew gematria is absolutely fascinating for anyone to study. But if you don't speak Hebrew, it's probably going to be very confusing. So that's why with my work, I'm typically doing it in just English. And um, you could use it in any language, as I said. Yeah, well, I mean, um, what's very fascinating about even just the Hebrew language is that it has a numer 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 a numerical value in addition to having a, a an alphabet or an, it's not alphanumeric but you get what i'm saying it, yeah. it serves both purposes so i found that to be interesting and then the fact that i guess the whole decoding thing now when you mention numbers how do you like where do you get like where is the cipher for telling you what numbers mean Oh, that's a great. So that was one thing I was going to say that's powerful about the Hebrew language is every letter has a meaning. In English, that's not the case. 
So Hebrew is a very, very special language uh, no, in that is, regard. It is. I it's was, I was super, fascinated by it's that. It's super special. So when you're it's talking about read backwards, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you're discussing the Kabbalah or you know anything that's going on, coming back to the Kabbalistic and esoteric Gnosticism, you're going to be seeing some really profound stuff. I mean, it's like magic spell casting. Um, anywho, to get back to the the answer to what's going on here. Um, you're asking me if there's a significance to certain ciphers over others and the kind of the utility of certain ciphers. Is that correct? Yeah. Like, well, when you said the number 15, I'm going to use 15, you said 14 and 15, but let's just use correct. 15. For example, where do I determine what the significance of what 15 represents? Great. So the numbers have their meanings from zero to nine. Zero, you could look at as like the cosmic egg. It's the number that gives birth to all the other numbers after it. But it also is the, it, it doesn't signify anything. Number The number zero is nothing. While on the other hand, the number nine is the number for everything. It's the number for spatial infinity. And when you look into the 369 code, which has been given to Tesla for whatever reason, but that's another story. If you look into the 369 code, you see the power of the mathematics surrounding that and specifically the number nine so just to start out zero the number of nothing nine the number of everything and then in between you have meaning for these numbers and a lot of it is taught to us in the bible uh believe it or not through the days of the creation story and when you start bringing in the periodic table you're going to see other connections i'll give an example six is the number of man it's the man was made on the sixth day periodic table you mean like your element chart correct okay the, like the table the of the periodic table. table of elements okay like where you see au for gold and then it would give its composition exactly so you're going to get two key numbers when you're looking at the periodic table of elements you're going to see the actual uh the number of the element itself and you're going to see the atomic mass or the atomic weight um but just to keep things very simple like i said before we're trying to get to the meaning behind the numbers and i'm going to tell you how we could get meaning to the number 15 for instance because it's just co a combination of the meaning of the numbers from zero to nine and then you would start combining them when you have double digits triple you know etc when you get to the thousands millions and so forth so just to look at the number six you have that being the day of the creation of man and we have the sixth element on the periodic table is carbon. And when <laughs> you actually look at what's going on here with the body, you know, you have carbon being six neutrons, six protons, six electrons. That's the six, six, six. They call this the number of the beast. But in actuality, life here in the physical realm is carbon based. So we are just carbon man. And that's a perfect connection going back to the number six in the Bible. Like, that is all we are, technically. Of course, we have other things, nitrogen, oxygen, et cetera. But the point here is that this physicality, this life is carbon. It's a carbon-based life. So it's amazing when you start finding the meanings of the numbers from looking at Abrahamic religion to going back to Egypt, or even if you wanted to look at it from math. Like I said before, when you look at the number nine mathematically, you're going to see absolutely mind-blowing connections. When you start getting into Fibonacci sequence or the prime numbers, you start to see even more meaning. Look at the shapes and sacred geometry. You're going to have even more meaning there. So this is just going back to like why the philosophers were so in and the alchemists which if you're going to talk about the kabbalah you're talking about a bunch of alchemical rabbis like that's all it was was they were at the highest level figuring out how to be how to merge with the spirit realm while they were here in the physical and how to tap into the spirit realm while they were in the physical that's why this kabbalah is not being read by everyone it's like being kept uh you know for specific people to read only and it's fascinating. Of course, as time has gone on, we have the internet, we have ways of sharing it. But before we were here, I mean, this was kept secret. And the Gnosticism that was within it, this, this hidden knowledge, um, it wasn't just given to everyone in uh, the orthodoxy, for instance. It was, it was kept there just like you would have secrets being kept in the Freemasonic order or the, uh, any of the secret societies. And that's what you see also when you start to study the Freemasons and everything that's branched off of the Bavarian Illuminati, et cetera, you're going to see them bringing it all back to the Kabbalah. 
they talk about gematria. They talk about how architecture is very specific where they would hide their secrets in the buildings. And now you know why they're called the Freemasons. You know, that's all coming back to being the architects. They're the architects of our realm. It's not just about the physical blocks and everything. Right. It's about it's about the knowledge of the dimensions and all of that. And I mean, that's where it really gets fascinating for me. Well, when you told me the etym etymological root of gematria, what you just said makes sense. So can Correct. you kind of explain a little bit about what the because it and and why? Mm -hmm. it, where, why the connection? Because I, I'm not seeing the connection except for two letters. Sure. Yeah. Well, so we're branch, we're branching off of different languages and different root languages. And and when we're talking English, we have a Latin based language, correct? Well, when we're yeah. come back, when we're bringing this back to uh, Greek and uh, Hebrew, well, that's not anywhere near the same. Of course, there are some Greek uh, components to to the language with that, but the bigger point here was that. There's a debate over the origin of the word, but there's no debate, uh, or I should say this more clearly, there's a debate over which culture somehow named it gematria. Okay. Um, but as for the meaning of the word itself, it is translated from the word geometry. And there's no kind of debate into, behind that. Which would kind of explain why the precision kind of goes into things, and, um, because mathematics is very precise. A hundred percent. And this is what allows us to have the structures and the buildings and all these temples and the fascinating architecture of our past. There's a reason why they're able to, I mean, just look at the pyramids, man. And you compare that cosmologically, like when you actually compare that to what's above it, as above, so below, you start to see that this building is not made by the normal contractor you see working on the building down the street from you. Right. Right. And we yeah, also, no. we I, not even to get into the conspiracy con conversation, but to bring it back to what we do have, which is the knowledge and the secrets hidden in the architecture. When you see stuff like the Sphinx and the Great Pyramids, you're like, oh, okay, well, this is a tech, this is a, a civilization that was much more advanced. And that's why Gematria is not spoken about openly when you're going through like a normal schooling system in the orthodoxy, they're not talking about the rabbi is not teaching children about gematria. It's actually a more hidden Kabbalistic code that's left for the rabbi Rebbe for them. Um, so even people that are in your normal, like Hasidic community, they're not learning about this. No, that's why I, I've always understood it as Jewish mysticism, which would be kind of like you're out of the normal realms of what people study and think of as the Jewish faith. Um, it's kind of limited, almost like a secret society within, within a Jewish faith almost. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, even openly, if you wanted to come back to the exoteric in Judaism, they share gifts in uh, 18s. That's very normal. Money, gifts of all kinds, they do it in the number 18. 18 means a lot to them. So this will actually help answer um, what we what you asked me before. You were like, what does the number 15 mean? Well, let's get to the number 18 and the importance of it in Judaism. This is fascinating. So the number one is the number of the universe. It's you are the one. You know, the Matrix movie, his name is Neo. His name is just the anagram of one. And the one is the universe. It's the connection to source. It's the connection to source energy. So this is why there's a chosen one. And it's always given, you know, to this leader whomever it be whether you're religious or whether you're you're looking at things from a superhero movie perspective or in mythology so one is the connection to source it is literally the embodied source and then you have the number eight this number is has a really amazing quality to it where you could flip it sideways you have that infinity symbol but when you look at it from the perspective of nature you have the sun's movement is in a pattern of the eight it's called the analema this is the pattern of our of our sun. And this is you could watch videos of people doing, you know, uh, what are they called? Long exposure shots or some sort of. um, Yeah. yeah so. That's it. So this is also the Mobius strip or the toroid, the toroidal field. You know, everything in this physical uh, dealing with energy is toroid, toroidal energy. So eight is a very powerful number. And you could also look at it as that. um connection to source so we have the one and the eight 
it is like this infinite connection to source it's like the the merging between the one and this natural movement pattern of energy not only in the physical but in the in the uh, etheric okay uh yeah i was trying to try to find some information about like a website that had like kind of like what an explanation of what the numbers mean uh, it's going to be so difficult to find because you're going to have a mathematical reasoning you're going to have a biblical reasoning you're going to have something that comes from people like in the new age you're going to have like everyone has their own meaning and that's actually an important part of my friday live streams is i tell people this is your truth and it's how it applies to your life and what could help you gain utility from it you're not going to do too well in life if all you care about is finding, you know, a singular meaning to anything. And that's what's difficult about education and the Internet. You know, a lot of the most amazing things are like an island hidden, hidden in a sea of trash. And it's so difficult to find truth that you end up noticing that truth has its momentary glimpse of an existence for you until it gets replaced by something that has more value. And whatever these numbers end up meaning, you know, they're going to have multiple meanings ultimately because we have all these cultures, all these ancient civilizations and it. It had its it had its importance for them, for their reality, their culture and what mattered, what mattered to them. So then would you think it's real easy for somebody to misinterpret the data based off of just how that they've learned about what the numbers represent? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Look at the num look at pi. That goes on forever. Right. It's not even a full integer. But we all agree that that's the circumference of a circle, but where does it end? Right? Look at Fibonacci. See, this is the thing. It's not about having answers. It's about seeing that this is a spiraling motion. Everything about time, your existence, even the physical when you go quantum, nothing is a full integer anymore, you know? So if you want to make something wrong, just add a decimal place <laughs> okay. and then you'll start to get inaccuracies. No, but I think that's an important thing to think about, right? No, it but, is. Because if we don't, we close ourselves down to the natural pattern of, rea of life. Life is not a full integer. The tree doesn't have 70,575 leaves on it. And by the time I'm done saying that number, a leaf has fell off. Right. So what does that matter? And I think sometimes in our seeking of truth, we forget this spiraling motion. We forget the Fibonacci. We forget that everything is just expanding and contracting. It's being born. It's dying. It's rotting. It's becoming fresh. And it's just cyclical. And that's what I think matters most. And this is kind of what brings it back to being open-minded. But you brought up a great point. It is sometimes difficult to interpret the data. That is why you need to specialize into something. So for me, I specialize in cryptocurrency. I'm not sitting around telling the world I know everything about everything. I'm very dialed in. I'm very focused. I share what has worked for me and I give it to the world. And if they want to take it and build off of it, then I think that's beautiful. Okay. No, that makes sense. And this website that we're showing, Jamatra Nader, um, it, it, it will be linked down below. Why do you why did you specifically suggest this website? Oh, I mean, it's just more user friendly um, on most browser types. It works well. Um, I don't really have like a whole lot of, uh, you know, negative things to say about it. I haven't experienced a crash or I'm sure there has been, but it's pretty smooth. It's pretty user friendly. It doesn't have any loading times or anything like that. And what I like is if you were to type in a number, uh, you could click on the numbers and you can start to see more data, mathematical data, like the triangular, the primes, the Fibonacci, the breakdown of a lot more. So if you're very data, data driven, you might enjoy this website. Whilst the one that you showed me earlier, the Gamatric, the Gamatrix or whatever, this mm -hmm. one is, is giving you feedback of taking your input, converting it to Hebrew and then giving you a form of Hebrew gematria that typically gives you these very big numbers. And then it starts preparing matches for you. And this is where it just gets off the rails. So like anything in life, if you want to learn something, you have to learn with the basics. And uh, I would just tell anyone who's going to play around with this website, never press that match button. That match button will be the death of you because it will just start to make you... Uh, uh, accept anything that matches when in reality there needs to be a rhyme and reason for these matches, you know? Right. So that's where you hold yourself off. Like, I think that this is what's kind of 
brought some toxicity to the gematria community or the decoding community is uh these matches and people writing in full-blown sentences and it's like dude you guys aren't bringing this back to any origins you need to slow yourselves down i think what you just said is probably what really kind of was one of the things that really turned me off about gematria and you know when i saw that and as it should and when I saw your channel, I, I was very skeptical. And then checking it out and then seeing you at Donut, it, it just solidified more. And that is why I wanted to have the conversation. So I'm glad that you took time to, to explain that. The other thing that I wanted to ask before we kind of I pick your brain about some things is you may have heard me mention it to Donut. I'm not sure if you've, if you've checked out all of our conversations, but you seem to be taking into account a lot of different things when it comes to cyclical type events. Um, meaning like the Jewish calendar, things to that effect. Because the Shemitah is every seven years, every mm -hmm. seven Shemitah is as a Jubilee, so every 49 to 50 years roughly. Mm -hmm. And have you looked, Have you, are you familiar with the, the book? It's called The Fourth Turning. Mm-mm by William Strauss and Neil Howe. So it's a it's a genealogical study. I'm going to pull up the website. But there's a book and it came out in the 90s and it's it's kind of hard to explain exactly what it is, but it's mm -hmm. based off of human studies of sociology and events that took place, mm -hmm. time periods, arc archetypes and in these saculums, different turnings, and then the turnings end in a fourth turning. So you have four different turnings within a saculum, and then it resets. And every fourth turning has turned out to be, let me see if I can pull up where it says on this website. So this gives the saculums the time from the climax of the crisis to the climax of the awakening, the climax year for awakening the crisis and then the crisis would be what takes place in the fourth turning. So every fourth turning in the Anglo American saculum to the, in the late medieval time period was the war of roses. Then in the reformation time period was the Armada crisis and the new world was the glorious revolution and the revolutionary time period, the American revolution, civil war, civil war, great mm -hmm. power was the great depression and the millennial what we would be in the fourth turning now. So one of the authors has passed away, William Strauss, but Neil Howe has been doing a lot of interviews over the years. And Tony Robbins recently brought him on. Mm. But the fourth turnings equate into, as you can see, not great situations, usually <laughs> wars and civil wars. Yeah, yeah. And it kind of fits in with where we are, it feels like, in our timeline. And I'm I was just curious if you've ever looked into this and seen where there was like any sort of parallelization between or some symbiosis between the fourth turnings and this idea, these generational studies. It's not completely mathematical. Yeah. Be because as you can see with yeah, there's um, some discrepancies when I was looking at the maths, but yeah, it's like 103 years for one saculum and and a hundred and roughly 81 for one. So, and sure. roughly a saculum is supposed to represent a lifetime. Yeah. A general lifetime of, you know, 80 to a hundred years is what we think of as a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And it goes into what takes place during the, the first turnings, the second turnings, the third turnings, the fourth turnings. And can you uh, just share the date that this is kind of not predicting, but like it's stating that there'll be this next event. Is that being shared in this? Yeah, it's saying 2008 um, up until um, currently is what it's stating. That and this Curr and this, currently, and this is is in, currently is in what year? Because it's a little like, bit small for me. I can't really see. Oh, sorry, man. Like we are currently supposed to be in the fourth turning. Okay. Well, I'll I don't know. Screen if this helps you at all. I don't know what this uh, is exactly, but I'll share my piece on it. Um, I think right now we are in a transition phase because we just entered what i'm calling biblical jubilee as of like two days ago so for anyone who's brand new to this idea of the the sabbatical cycle it's a seven-year cycle that's practiced in judaism the and shemitah. it has the shemitah exactly and i've been covering this on my channel now uh waters above for like over a year now um 
So if anyone's interested in learning the details of what's going on here, I go over that very thoroughly in my in my YouTube videos. But to give people an idea of the cyclical nature and how this all adds up, I have been sharing that I see the last Jubilee to have been in 1973. And that is in perfect, you know, <laughs> it perfectly aligns with the Nixon phase for the United States of America. But we've seen how America has done since. And it's been it's been incredible. I mean, seriously, this is like the Garden of Eden. And people have been lately trying to figure out, and you probably noticed this as well, is like, when will USA be dethroned? That's like the biggest theme across any, you know, truth YouTubers or any people is like, where does Russia, China, and the USA fit into like this next shift? Perhaps people may even be thinking about Europe as well. And I keep telling people that I look at the next Shemitah, the next seven-year cycle, which will be transitioning into 2028 and 2029. That will be the end of the reign of this type of vibe that we have in the United States of America. But until then, I think the United States of America will remain one of the best places to be. Um, there will be trials and tribulations across the way. Of course, we had our 9-11. We had our, you know, uh, we had Vietnam and all that shit that kind of brought some some weirdness to the environment. But as for this being like a safe zone, I think this has been predetermined to be a safe zone until we get to the next cycle after the biblical jubilee. So there will be sacrifices leading between pretty much last year, by the way, two years ago throughout 2029 and these sacrifices are pretty obvious where you're seeing places like lebanon just get floored you're seeing i mean just look at lately over the past week we've watched currency debasement crisis happening slowly where like the euro is at all-time lows comparatively to the usd we're seeing the same problem with the pound we're the seeing pound issues 20 percent year to date Right. So if anyone followed my work over a year and a half ago, they will know that I was very adamant about the U.S. dollar having a deflationary spike throughout the entirety of 2022. It brought a lot of controversy because everyone talks about the death of the dollar. And I was telling them, no, the dollar is going to do really well because if you look at the machinations of why it will do well, it's because everything else is going to do bad. If everything else does bad, it has to go somewhere. So the U.S. dollar is like the cleanest, dirty laundry. I'm not saying it's great. It's no, still, I know what you're saying. It's still fiat. It's still you know infinitely printable dog shit. But compared against be, everything else, it's the best. It's the best thing to deal with to be in right now, based off of the and, way the system is going. And right now is going to last a lot more than people think. Because people, they think these moments are quick, but when you live through them, you'll see that this could take four to seven years to play out where the U.S. dollar will, where this environment of economics that we're seeing is just getting started of the crisis. So we have some, and I would love to talk about some of these things too, if it'll bring value to, to you and your community. But I think the U.S. dollar and the U.S. in and of itself is going through a phase where we're going to have like what I call the seven good years. And then we're going to see the start of an empire falling. And it's going to be in that next 2028, 2029 Shemitah. Okay. So I want to real quick touch on a few things that you said. So do you believe that at, at the end of this last Shemitah ended just a few days ago that we are, that this was the Jubilee period of the Shemitahs to every 49, 50 years? Yeah, and it's difficult when we talk about this idea of Jubilee because Jubilee typically would mean like reversing slavery, giving back land to people it was confiscated from, getting rid of debts. But people need to understand that this was all like a, a conversation back before we had iPhones and virtual reality headsets. Yeah, The apex predator, whoever is running this realm, you know, you could call them elites if you like. There, it, just because Jubilee is supposed to be a good thing, it's the same thing with Shemitah. When you research what Shemitah is, historic, like what it means in Judaism, it's supposed to be a positive thing. But remember, it will be positive for few while it's disaster for most. That well, is what... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's totally fine. I was just going to say that these are going to be siphoning energy, currency, and uh, life force from the majority whilst it's feeding a smaller group, a smaller entity. And I am just clear on my vision of what's to come for precious metals, for housing, for all these things. And, and I'm, I'm obviously American. I believe you are American as well. And perhaps that would mean that we're drawing a majority of our listeners are, are from America. 
I'm not here to like to pump up America as this great place. Like it's a parasite in and of itself, but yeah. I do need, I'm a global analyst. I'm looking at this holistically. And if I had to kind of break down my feelings, it's no different than how I felt over a year and a half ago when I learned about the Shemitah and started sharing that with the world. So this Jubilee that should be a positive thing by definition, do you think that the people who control this world will ever do something positive for you? No. You change your own life by being aware of this knowledge and being prepared and taking action when these crashes come or preparing yourself ge uh, with your geographical location. You know, there's yeah. going to be places that are going to be more difficult to live in than others. So you should have been preparing accordingly. Uh, and, you know, with these technologies that we have today, there's no excuses, man. No, I agree. I do. I do. And uh, when the Shmita thing, you know, I've been getting really fascinated Obviously, Donut was talking a lot about it. I started researching it, and then uh, I interviewed somebody who's in the crypto space. Um, his name is Madi Greenspan. Uh, Madi is actually short for Matis Yahoo. He's he lives okay. in Israel. He's a non-observant Jew. Um, he brought up the Shemitah before we started recording, saying that he was going to be writing in in his newsletter about the Shemitah and comparing it to the financial markets. And, and I'd like to ask you this because I found it very fascinating. I'm assuming that you went back and started looking every seven years when Shemitahs were going on, looking at financial markets and what was taking place. Correct. That's uh, kind of what brought me to that enlightening moment of what was to come in 2021, 2022. Okay. So one of the things that he was saying, and, and tell me if your research kind of is in the same area, is that generally speaking within two months of the ending of a shmita a sabbatical year um because there's generally down downward action happening in financial markets mm -hmm. and within two months and it's not a perfect science it could be the day after it could be two months to the day i don't know Correct. but just a two month not time frame is when we see the bottoms yes of those markets so it's really depending on the cycle. And if I had to give people my exact outlook, um, I would say that we're going to see the deflationary spike in the DXY happen in that two month time frame. And of course, that correlates with a sharp uh, downturn in the overall markets. Um, do you want to talk specifically for crypto or everything? Because uh, I would like to tailor an answer in response to whatever's best for, for you. Um, how do you... What do you think is best to go forward with? So for me, um, I do think that crypto is going to be slightly in correlation to this, but because it's the newest, most nascent asset class and it still has a lot of junk to get rid of, um, it's not going to bottom out the same way that the indices do. So I think that crypto will bottom out within that two month time frame. So I agree with uh, this, uh, this, in, this analyst. And the reason is esoteric, actually. It has to do with the eclipses that follow Shemitah. So if anyone is aware, Rosh Hashanah is always changing, right? And that's the beginning of the Jewish New Year. Exactly, the Jewish New Year. So Rosh Hashanah is always altered every single Gregorian year because that <laughs> if you're comparing our normal calendar, it's the Gregorian calendar. So right. whilst, whilst we're in 2022 currently, uh, as of two days ago, in the Hebrew calendar, they shifted from the year 5,782 to the year 5,783. And that they're operating in that new calendrical year. And to be giving precise um, uh, analysis, I'm noticing that that, that next eclipse that follows the Shemitah is where we've had some of our most historic market crashes of all time. For instance, the 1987 one was a, was a great example. So if you pay attention to the Black Monday, correct. If you pay attention to that specific market in that year, it was amazing, dude. We went up in a straight line all the way until the end of Shemitah. And then we maintained structure, had a little bit of what is called a bull trap where you have a sharp decline and then a buyback that looks like a, it looks like it's going to be bullish, like a bullish buyback, but it's not because it's a bull trap. And anyone who uses a Fibonacci retracement tool could kind of learn how to determine this. But anyways, when we broke support on the return was exactly sandwiched in between two, in between eclipses. And then when we had that Black Monday event, that was all about the eclipse. Now, when you're saying eclipses, you know, obviously we can have solar, lunar. Correct. What kind of eclipses are we talking? Does it matter? 
So there's different types of eclipses. Some of them have more uh, power than others. And if you look at total eclipses, those are really the big boys. Like, is it, a, is it a total eclipse of the heart? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to, man. <laughs> Had to add some humor to this. Uh, this oh, we're uh, gonna mind we're gonna get along. <laughs> I appreciate you. No That's problem. Funny. So, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So, um, well, my analysis has been showing me that the November eclipse is really gonna be the one to pay attention to. That's November seventh, and um, right, that is a the total day to the day before the midterm elections. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. I just. No, it's great. It it's great that you're adding in uh, this in, this other important information. So, yeah, the eclipse of November 7th is really, really important because it's a total lunar eclipse. And right now we're actually in a lunar phase uh, when you're looking at just astrology as a whole. We're not going to be in a solar phase until we flip into the eclipses of April and May. Uh, that's more like science based uh, uh, astrology stuff. But getting back on track. Between that time frame of now and April, or let's just call it the end of Q1 of 2023, that right. is when I'm seeing the the market enter, like the overall stock market enter a, a selling climax, if you like Wyckoff method, or we could just call it the bottom. Now, I, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of correlation with the crypto and you know, the traditional stock market. I mean, I know you can't necessarily foresee this or give me like specifics, but do you see a decorrelation anytime in that time period between now and what you're saying for the traditional finance mm -hmm. bottom? So when we and I actually made a video on Patreon, I made two videos on Patreon that really broke this all down. They were long format videos, about one hour long. And the first one was called the Shmita Decoded. And then the second one I released some months later, it was called the Jubilee Decoded. And it was combining all these past cycles of the Shmita with the uh, consideration of the last Shmita that happened, which Bitcoin was actually trading during that time. It was the 2015 uh, market. So what's amazing is at the end of that Shmita, we saw the stock market go down. But we saw Bitcoin rise. Yeah. Okay. So another thing to mention is if you look at the percentage gains of Bitcoin compared to everything else, I mean, it blows <laughs> everything out of the water. It's yeah. The, since the creation the of greatest... Bitcoin, since since two thousand and nine, or maybe you could say a little bit later when it actually was on exchanges, but it's yeah. been the best actual trading asset since its existence of all time. Yeah. Everything. Since its existence. Of, and then if, yeah, if you take back and go all time, yeah, 100%. Yeah. So that's what makes me as an analyst. There's a couple of things. And this is what gives you the, like you and your listeners, a lot of, you know, a deep dive into the way I'm looking at this market. I'm not a Bitcoin maxi. And I'm also a true technical analyst where I'm going to admit that we don't have a lot of chart data with the Bitcoin uh, conversation. We don't have a lot of bull runs and bear market cycles. So we're limited in our data. But when we're looking at the S&P, when we're looking at you know precious metals charts, we have a lot of data we could look at. So with Bitcoin as part of this conversation, because it's performed so damn well, and because in the last Shmita, it had this complete opposite reaction where at the end of that Rosh Hashanah, it just went on an uptrend into a new bull run. Whilst the regular stock market was kind of stable and remained stable all the way up until 2021, while Bitcoin went on a whole new rally into 2017 at the end of the year. So think about this, right? Not only was it Bitcoin, I mean, look at that XRP bull run. That was insane. So we watched uh, XRP do its only historic jump up, and it was during that time frame. At the yeah, you're end talking about prior to the SEC putting the case against XRP, right? Yeah, I mean, if it, what's nice about XRP on TradingView is there is a chart available, the Bitstamp chart, and that Bitstamp chart actually brings you back very far. It brings you back to when XRP was trading in 2013. Wow. So I actually have shared a lot of analysis on that chart, and I've shown people uh, and actually kind of broken down reasons why I don't see any new crazy all-time high bull runs for XRP until we get into the next uh, halving. But that's not... Uh, the focus of what you asked, pretty much to just. And you're, but to clarify, you're talking about the Bitcoin having. Correct. Yeah, the having. There's te technically no other <clears throat> having. Right? Yeah, it's the having. It's the only one people should care about if they're trying to look at this from a crypto uh, 
perspective. So anyways, um, in that Jubilee Decoded video, I was very clear that there is a prior iteration of a 2014 through 2016 cycle. It was not a catastrophic uh, market crash like you typically would see during a Shemitah. It was just isolated to the Asian market. So you saw the Chinese stock market take a little bit of a hit. And that's a big deal, right? Because everything is made in China. So it created problems, right? Like the same with 1993 where you had the bond market uh, was an issue. So when people look at the Shemitah, sometimes they're trying to like always find indice crashes. And I'm like, no, guys, like you need to look at this like holistically. And cryptocurrency is is wild because it'll take 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 percent gains, and then it'll pull back 95 to 99 percent. And then it'll sometimes they go to zero and some of them repeat a new cycle. It's it's almost impossible to determine. But with Bitcoin, I mean, the performance and the chart history is is there and we have a lot to um, we could use that as analysts. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And um, and I do want to be respectful of your time as well. And I, so and I do want to do more conversations. Hopefully you're you're cool with that. Yeah, of course, brother. Actually, I'm free on time. So if you wanted to go for an extra 15, 20 minutes or whatever, we're good. Okay. That and that's totally possible. What I wanted to ask you is um some questions about some cryptocurrencies. So you mentioned Satoshi uh, and you mentioned Saturn. And I s I've I've heard Donut talk about Bitcoin or BTC being 322. I'm not seeing that in the Gematria, what that would mean. But what are your thoughts on Satoshi, who Satoshi is, where the Saturn stuff comes and plays in with yeah. that? So the Saturn thing is just about the etymology. Like we have the word Saturday. That's the day of Saturn. That's the Sabbath day. And if you pay attention to Bitcoin, you see there was multiple highs that were leading into Saturnalia, which is that time frame and what we now call Christmas. But we've seen uh, Bitcoin have its best performance and its worst performance all around that type of leaving the Saturnalia time frame. Uh, and that's that's evident in the charts. It's proven. Um, yeah, but technically, doesn't the rest of the traditional markets, I mean, we call, I think we, they, we refer to what you're talking about as the Santa Claus rallies. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So it's well, not I, isolated, just crypto necessarily, though. Yeah, and I'm, gla I'm really glad you brought that up because remember, what is making these big market uh, rises and these big market sell-offs happen, in my opinion, it's the Shemitah. And what is the Shemitah? It's the sabbatical year. It is the year of Saturn. So why are we having all of these, you know, look at the 2000, 2001 market. We had a para, uh, parabolic market, which led to a dramatic sell-off. You look at what happened in 2007, 2008. We had a bull run, which led to a dramatic sell-off. You look at what just happened recently into 2021, the, uh, the start of 2022, we went up parabolically and now we're starting to see the sell-off happen and you could keep doing this through a lot of cycles but it's not isolated um it's it, it's not 100 isolated to bitcoin as you said but we only have a couple market cycles to prove this okay um, you, but you mentioned um sabbatical being etymologically intact with saturn but i was i would think that would be more related to sabbath and then sabbath i correlate more to sunday not no. necessarily Saturday. I guess that's kind of the confusion is. No, uh, so the, the, the Sabbath day in Judaism is practiced on a Saturday and uh, Christians use Sunday, but the Jews use Saturday. Right. It was the Holy Roman Empire that changed it to. Yeah. Sunday. And if you if you look at. Yeah. And actually, that's that's great that you brought that up, too, because when you look at the Julian calendar, you'll start to see some more stuff that you could add into the esoteric conversation. But. So far with Bitcoin and its price performance, one thing that's amazing is how Bitcoin's local high, all-time high at this time is $69,000 and Saturn in Gamatria equals 69. Also Saturn in two, two ciphers, full reduction and the Chaldean cipher equals 21 and Bitcoin has 21 million coins in supply. We, we would see a lot of connection as well with Bitcoin hitting all-time highs on new moons like this type of stuff is super interesting when you start to actually, you know, look at the deeper connections. But well, I mean, okay. so you said sixty nine, and that, um, what did you say equated out to the number sixty nine? Because that that ended up being the, the word the, Saturn. Okay, now would that mean that you don't see Bitcoin going above that price? 
Well, I'm sure people thought that when it hit 3000 and then they probably thought that again when it hit 19,000 and then here we are now at 69 and there's still Yeah, but so did much it fit did it fit into gem Gematria at 3000 or 16,000 or whatever the figures were? Um, just being that just being at 69 came in. I don't know, is that just kind of coincidental that it hit well, 69? I find it really interesting that it hit 69k in the year of Saturn during a Shemitah. That is okay, really okay. fascinating. I mean, there's a lot of correlation with that. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense when you're putting in other factors that I wasn't thinking yeah, about. Yeah, so I mean, BTC, the ticker symbol, equals 20 in reverse full reduction. The last all-time high was basically that $20,000 target. Um, I mean, you could, you could decode accordingly, but I would also like to add a technical analysis uh, element to that, you know, because it's not just all about the gematria. You kind of want to take multiple things and combine them together, but... To get back to um, the breakdown of Satoshi and all of what's going on, um, I mean, Satoshi is not a person. It's an archetype, and this archetype is very similar with Saturn, and it brings about an energy that has influence on what's happening in the realm, just like the work of Jordan Maxwell where he was exposing that the court system has everything to do with Saturn. Um and if you look at Bitcoin as like an energy source, if you will, I've been in my work, I'll speak for myself. I've been looking at Bitcoin like the artificial sun of Saturn. It's essentially the power plant of the cryptocurrency and blockchain, you know, market, whatever, whatever you want to call that. And I, I believe they named it Genesis block on purpose. You know, that was the first blocks mind. It was the it was called the Genesis block. Right. Um, and remember, like before we have Christianity, we have Judaism. It's just all the same. It's being borrowed from that. And you could keep going back all the way till you get to um, Egypt. So keeping this on track, there's so much to say about the Saturn Satoshi connections. But Do you think Satoshi, the, the entity group or whatever, was aware of this when it was going on? Yeah, I think they created the algorithm. They they are on you, purpose. Like they chose the name very strategically based off of all the information that you've just shared. Well, I'm sure they have a lot more reason to, right, what, right. They, to what they did. Um, because when you start getting into really uh, you know, I'll give an example of what's amazing about this conversation with crypto. A lot of people believe crypto comes from the word crypt, which has to deal with like death. It's cryptos, the the Greek word. Cryptos, exactly. Krup, krup, it's K R U P T O S, I believe, which means just secret or hidden. Same thing as a cult. Exactly. They could have called it a cult currency and it made the same thing, but then that would have sounded even worse. You are correct. It, and and then you could bring it into the periodic table of elements with Krypton, and you could just keep going deeper and deeper as you decode. But my my point here is that it means secret. You know, it operates in secret, just like secret societies do. And what better way to kick off this whole blockchain and cryptocurrency conversation than with an anonymous, unknown, you know, completely random individual that has no traceability and was connected to Hal Finney. And when you take Hal Finney's birthday and you mirror it, it's Satoshi Nakamoto's birthday. Also, well, that's that, that was going to be one of the things I asked you is like from from your studying with Gematria and stuff, have you? Do you have an indication as to who Satoshi is or was? I would probably come out and say it's the central banks. Like if okay. I had to give an answer as to what it actually is, I think it is running by a supercomputer, probably at CERN or some sort of military base. It's probably running and operating by the, the leadership of this realm. And it probably has ties to the Swiss banking system, the Vatican, the city of London, that that whole cabal and then some stuff that's going on in saskatchewan territory specifically isolated to supercomputers but if i had to give an answer to you brother i think it is a computer grid network of, of different nodes it is decentralized but who's actually running it it was 100 predetermined centralized and they knew that it would be having these price fluctuations accordingly based on that having cycle based on yeah they had it all predetermined Okay. Well, I mean, if you're saying that, we're just kind of speculating. When I mean, you say central banks, I mean, there's obviously, I don't, I wouldn't put all central banks on the same page. Um, you have like your international bank of settlements, you have your IMF, um, your international monetary fund, you have the, the federal reserve. Now you have the BRICS nation banks. Yeah. Would you equate it to 
the, the system working together or would you equate it to one particular part of the central banks, as I mentioned? I look at everything as what you just said. That is globalism. Okay. No, they yeah. all work together. They're all in cahoots with each other. They don't give a fuck about me and you. Everything is about stealing our money through taxation and creating new laws and whatever they like it has really nothing to do with um, us and everything to do with them working together as a team. And they set up all these events and say that there's a war here and this, that and the third, but they're all working behind the scenes together. It comes back to the Vatican, Washington, D.C. and the city of London. That's what's running the show. And they're leveraging on what's happening in Switzerland to kind of just have, you know, a, a back door. See, I, I kind of want to not think that there's any truth to that just because I, I would want I want to think that Bitcoin was created as an answer for us to get away from this. Like almost, I know. As, almost like as if it was dropped by God or if it was the government, like the NSA, that it was because I believe in dualities of everything. It could have been good guys in the system who were foreseeing where we were headed and gave us all an answer or AI could be a lot more advanced than we are aware. And this is a creation of artificial intelligence. There's so many different possibilities, but I, I don't want to think of it being connected with the Vatican. I know, I know, I know the design or even the I know. And a lot of people that have come across my work in the early stages, they were kind of turned off by my vision on that. And I get it, brother. Like I, I totally know why we would naturally not want that to be the case. But if we just look at the liquidity, like if we look at the if way we're that, logical and, and and take emotion out of it, maybe I'll see things differently. I think it's emotion that and like yeah. the goodness within you, like because you're not one of them and you're a real like love based human who wants the like the betterment for our species. That is why you're digging into that place of your soul and you're feeling that way. I completely get it. And there was a piece of me that used to think the same. But this is about money, brother. Mm. And anything about money is the just... The root a, of all evil. Well, it's not really... The, it's the love. It's the, the love, love of the obsession the, I, and the materialism. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I don't believe that the wealth is the problem here. It's the poverty. And one of the things that could set people free from a lot of this is getting the emotions out of it. That was actually what we kicked off our, our conversation with before we started off the this uh, podcast was talking yeah. about how like I found a deeper purpose to my work, which was getting the emotions completely out of this and focusing on myself, focusing on the truth that has set me free. And when it comes to who's running this and who created this and this, that and the third, it, it actually doesn't matter. It's how you respond to it. So if Bitcoin has a crash, will you buy the dip? If Bitcoin starts to go like to absurd new highs, will you sell it? Like, how are you taking action on this market? Whether it's real or not real, anyone in this world can say that your job is less important than their job or what they do is better than what you do. Like we could play that game all day, you know, and some people in this world think that the Vatican is a good place, a necessary place. Meanwhile, they have sexual pedophile allegations. Yeah, just let's be careful. Let's just be real careful right here. I don't want the YouTube overlords yeah. to... Uh... To Fine. come down, cracking the whip on me, sir. Totally, totally. Um, but I, but I get what you're saying. I, unfortunately, just yeah, in certain situations, I got to play a better game of chess about what I say and what's said on the channel. Respect that. But we're in complete agreement. Um, but that also makes me want to ask you a question, that, and you can refrain from answering if you like. It's totally cool. I respect that. But it makes me wonder, like, what your 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 end goal, intention, investing in crypto. Like, or do you actually believe in what Bitcoin represents in that idea? Like, are you accumulating more Bitcoin? Are you trying to get more U.S. dollars? Are you diversifying in other elements? Where's your head at with that? I'm trying to do whatever is necessary to facilitate my well-being. And I understand that a part of that is money. And when it comes to being able to take a small amount of money and make it work for you, investing is one of the avenues to do such. If it happens to be investing in the most nascent asset class, I'm aware that it brings volatility. It's going to get scary at some times. It's going to be, you know, just a wild ride. I'm willing to accept defeat if that happens because I've developed my own investment thesis that follows along my time horizon 
and what I'm willing to put into this market. So this to me, the there is no end goal. I'm just here to live my life. And I believe that what I've figured out about this market and what I've helped the world with with my with my art is to see a layer to this that could be removing their addiction to staring at charts or looking at their portfolio bounce up and down or just getting addicted to actually being maybe over involved in their investments when investments were never a primary function of any a rich or successful person's life anyways. I mean, at least when we're talking about investing in the um what would be the the proper word? Um, risk on assets. You know, right. when it comes to housing, of course, that's the greatest uh, opportunity you could get. Maybe not as easy as today as it was back in a, another time frame. But you know, when you think about Warren Buffett, he's not sitting around fucking day trading, right? No. But when yeah, people you... get into crypto, they're sitting around staring at the charts, sweating if XRP goes up three percent. And I unhealthy. I noticed this in people, and I knew that it was damaging them. And every bull run, whilst it creates some millionaires, it also creates a lot of damaged souls, like people that just get really, really disturbed by it. So for me, I'm just playing my role as an set by set by example educator in the space. And I hope that what I've brought to the world is unique and has helped people not only in the technical format, but it's helped people in the more like emotional conscious uh, perspective as well. And to see to see something that's more important than money, because the money is great and all. But if you hate your life with all the money, the money doesn't have any value. Yeah. And if you're not careful, money can bring it can accentuate parts of you that you may not even been aware of. A hundred percent. And I think any of us who are in these more first world environments, we take a lot of things for granted. Um, I know so many people that I've worked with private clients of mine, people that have coached, consulted directly, who had lost relationships in their life with not only their significant other, but with their children because of becoming investors and traders. They've put their whole life on the sidelines because of this addiction to looking at charts all day. And it's so sad to see people who are awake. And I don't say this to disrespect anyone or demean anyone who's going through this themselves, but I'm sharing it because it's the truth and it's necessary to bring up. But if you're waking up in the morning and you're checking your phone and you're getting emotionally upset at the price of the coin that you like being down, but in the other room, your, ch your children are sleeping sound. You should probably like put the phone down and go like walk over, kiss your children, tell them good morning and make them breakfast, like get yeah. your life back. And yeah, I'm no, watching I, I, people's lives fall apart because of bull runs and bear markets. I know I agree. I definitely try to pass on the same mental health advice um, because I mean, obviously the biggest the biggest thing that's going to affect somebody is emotions. Uh, and that's that's usually like when you were mentioning the worst time for people to invest is when the emotions come into play and they get that FOMO, that fear of missing out. And that's when people, the public, buy the retail investors buy in at the top of markets, which gives that exit liquidity to the rich mofos. Right. They're playing um, a game of emotions. They know this is sentiment at the end of the day. And like my advice to people to get better at becoming an investor is it's easier said than done to say, get your emotions out of it. But I'll just tell you this. Everything is a mirror reflection. So when you're looking into the mirror and we'll call this analyzing the market, when you're looking at the retail, get really upset, really depressed, really worried or really bored. That is the greatest time to invest. Totally, totally buy buy the blood or buy the boredom you when do you either of yeah. those things over a long enough time horizon you will be successful if you can get the idea of buying when it's low and selling when it's high yeah, but you gotta uh, you, it takes a little bit of obviously getting your feet wet and really trying to spend the time to understand the market and the cycles and if you're with the right people that are educating you i think that's um key to that. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute when we do the wrap up. The last thing I wanted to ask you before we, you know, continue on with more conversations in the future is um, you do talk a lot about XRP. I'm not necessarily a huge XRP fan. Uh, I do own XRP and my purpose in having XRP is to accumulate more of other cryptocurrencies ultimately. Mm. Um, but what are your overall thoughts from Gematria perspective the whole ripple water connection with the 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 water based Admiralty monetary law. system yeah. yeah because i mean money's liquid yeah um we see all these different currency currency <laughs> we see all these different 
mon like water based type yep. concepts. I even went back to watch the world, the, the movie water world to see if there was any correlation to any of this. <laughs> and I didn't see it. I didn't, yeah. maybe somebody else did, but yeah, XRP, um, I'd like to find out your fascination if, with XRP and overall, like what your thoughts are. Yeah. So um, I look at XRP as a very, very important project for the long term of this whole conversation around cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. And it's because it will be the banking part of the conversation. So there's multiple parts to this. There's insurance, there's gaming, there's uh, logistics. I mean, blockchain could be anything. It could be used as an alternative voting system. Uh, but as a currency, um, that's kind of what most people are interested in XRP for and being some sort of like liquidity bridge between the old and the new, if you will. And I'm not going to get into the ins and outs of the coin. Anyone could go find tons right. of information. Yeah, I'm not asking for me, for it's about the connections of Gamatria, specifically with price targets. And this was the coin that I was the most successful in showing the world how Gamatria is profound um, in this market. And I mean, the greatest calls I've made on on with Gamatria have been with XRP. Even quite recently, actually, I made a video. I talked about XRP when it was like 43 cents. And I, I shared a breakout target of 49 cents to 55 cents. And I said, if we close a daily near that 49 cent level, we will see within the next day the 55 cent target hit. It nailed it. And then it rolled down. That was exactly how the play was. And the reason was because of the Jubilee jubilee is the 49 years or the seven cycles of seven it's practiced on the 50th year and then that 55 56 level was due to the connection to the technical analysis that i was sharing just showing you how this is a thin layer of almost no trading action we could spike up to that very very quickly in a wick but at, now at the same time there was a lot of speculation that the court case was pretty much going to be over soon Yes. That SEC is kind of changes course about how they're going to be proceeding forward um, with the way that they're trying to tag the uh, XRP as being a security. So yep. uh, it's interesting how it all plays out together. What about the, um, I call it meme magic. Every time I see the, <laughs> the, the, what is it called? Kep? Kank? It's a word for the frog. Um, Kemet. Are you familiar with the word Kemet? K E M I T. Uh, well, I'm aware of the, yeah, yeah. Kemet so the, going yeah, back like, to Egypt. Are you talking about? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like oh, when damn. you see all yeah. the meme, the memes with the frog on there. A lot of the chain link community no, were using this. Um, there's just, it's just to me, it's a, I call it meme magic, and yeah. there's a lot of these XRP memes about five eight nine. Yeah. <laughs> Where does that come into play? Is that just something ridiculous or does that fit in with numerology or gematria? Totally. So five plus eight plus nine equals 22 and full reduction XRP equals 22. We just made it through the year of 22 in Hebrew where we had the year 5,782, which five plus seven plus eight plus two equals 22. 22 is the number, the master number that represents the master builder and the master destroyer. So it was important that XRP went through this shitty time frame because it will sort of be one of those coins that has, you know, it prevails whilst a lot of other things are going away. And the reason I say this is because if you analyze the crypto market at this time, you're going to see 20,000 plus altcoins. You can probably only count enough on two hands. So a lot of it is just what we call shit coins, and these mm -hmm. need to go to zero. And when they go to zero, that liquidity will shift back into the stuff that actually has a use case and, and utility. And we know without, uh, I mean, anyone who studies the way central banking is moving and SWIFT and all of the, the future chains, changes with ISO 222, again, another 22, you're going to see like all of these, all of these um, important uh places for this instrument that is xrp and now will it hit 589 dollars i think i was thinking more of like five dollars and 89 cents yes. oh totally but 589 dollars would be a blessing <laughs> yeah I, and i think I, I might start wearing ripple shirts and xrp <laughs> shirts <laughs> you could start using a gucci you could use gucci toilet paper then <laughs> sure enough <laughs> that's hilarious so well, when it comes to price targets and all of that, this is the coin that I've covered the most um, regarding how I believe it will perform in the next cycle. And um, 
you know, I don't see these crazy double digit prices happening anytime soon. I think it's going to take the next Bitcoin having to be fulfilled in order for that to occur. We're going to probably need to see a six digit Bitcoin before we can see a double digit XRP. And this is just the way it works. And people who disregard like this idea, you can just go back to my channel when it first started, when I was calling out, we will see XRP hit $1 for the first time all the way since the last time, three years ago, I called this out. We watched it come to fruition and I was publicly talking about selling my XRP at a dollar seventy, dollar eighty in that in those levels. And people were really upset with me. It was the XRP army. They were mad because I wasn't talking about five hundred dollar or fifty dollar XRP. And I said, guys, I'm a technical analyst. I have my family to take care of. Like this target looks sexy to me. I'm selling. And it was one yeah. of the greatest decisions. The same thing in my mastermind course, my crypto mastermind, when the SEC case happened, I have a video live in that video where it's during the days of the SEC crash. And I'm talking about buying all that XRP. I was confident that it wouldn't go lower. So the purpose behind this is they are using this token right now to play a game with investors. They're playing a game with everyone and they're using this SEC thing as a big part of that game. And I believe it's kind of this distraction away from the bigger picture. So the SEC case will play a role in the price appreciation in the future for XRP. There's no doubt about it. But the timing of the XR of the SEC case coming out against Ripple and the timing of when it will be over with, I can almost guarantee you will be in confluence with so many other things that are going on. Uh, I would have to say I agree without even knowing a hundred a hundred percent specifics but based off what you said uh you know i was thinking about the is the i the iso 222 I, yeah i always want to say it differently because when you say 222 it sounds like, <laughs> it's two, like two, two. grammatically wrong yeah. right it's 20022 correct is, that's how i like to say it iso 20022 but there's a speculation about some of the approved cryptocurrencies yeah some people are speculating xrp stellar um, well, there's no speculation needed. Grab. There's no speculation needed for those because they're already compliant. So that that means they're already ISO compliant. Well, it's, even Cardano was in there, which I thought was interesting. Yes, and I've heard and Bitcoin, Bitcoin is what, part of the conversation, but Bitcoin is not actually ISO compliant as of now. But there's two ticker symbols for Bitcoin, which actually makes me very confused. It's XBT, and then you have BTC. Yeah, the or I've always known as XBTC. X so if you were to type in Bitcoin in like Wikipedia or something, you're going to see two main ticker symbols. You're going to see XBT and you're going to see uh, BTC as the as the two types. But I believe that XBT is probably the ISO uh, compliant one that that was like a placeholder before we even had the XRP conversation. And it's kind of interesting how they're using that X letter uh, the same way with Stellar Lumens having the X in front of it or uh, Zinfin. a lot of the cryptos did even Monero. Right. XMR, XMR, XLM. Um, and yeah, it just it says that uh, XBT, XBT uh, is basically an alternative ticker symbol. So yeah, maybe it was something. I that think it's a placeholder. A place it's a placeholder. I know that Bitcoin will be part of this future as as the part of the future economy more as like the new digital gold. And I hate. I don't. I don't like using the word hate, but I don't like saying that because it's in alignment with a lot of other people believe. And you know, I have a very, very unique perspective on everything that's going on here. So when I come out and say things like that, I know it's kind of going along with some narratives. But what I mean by this is it will kind of be like a it'll be looked at and regarded almost like a digital real estate or something where Bitcoin used to be 3000 as like a bottom. Then it shifted up. You know, now we're seeing kind of like the 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 low 20s and when it makes its next stair step up it's going to move into the territory of like what cheap houses used to be and i believe it will continue to follow this uh indefinitely it'll lose the roi over time the crashes will become less steep it'll mature and a thing about all of this is the timing of it all because i think that this moment where the next step up for bitcoin happens will probably be in alignment with the sec thing It'll be in alignment with the launch and rollout of a brand new economy for all we know, where we're starting to see these so-called ISO compliant tokens become instruments of a 
actual utility instruments of the economy that we deal with, like as retail. Right. That includes some CBDCs. People, correct. Some sort of digital stable coin. Some people are calling it central bank digital currencies. Yes. So, so that's so it to me is the bridge that connects it all because you're going to have bricks having their own SDR. Yeah. their own basket of their own fiat currencies. You're going to have the IMF having their SDR. You're going to have all the different central bank digital you currencies. Fed now payment system that that's just launched. Saying. Yeah. Right. And and ISO is an upgrade to the SWIFT system. So that's where I feel like ISO is like the bridge that interconnects the globalization. It may, it may look separate, but it's all Yeah, it's just going to be a, it's just going to be a language essentially, like a programming language. And, and if, if what Bitcoin I believe was created by central bankers, it would make sense that it would be part of ISO. Yeah. And not only created by central banks, but created by the people who created central banks, like the bloodlines that go back to the or like the actual blueprint makers of this system that we have today of taxation and, and control <sighs> over military control over precious metals and where they're mined. I mean, there's so many parts to this, right? Like if you just look at military and the military involvement across the time horizon of our known history, it's been in protection of the central bank, of the Federal Reserve. You look at the nations that did not want to move forward with that system. That was the nation that we went to war with. How interesting is that? Yeah, but then you also got to think about what's, I, I just as a wrench, and this is another tangent that we could discuss another time, but El Salvador kind of bucketing against the globalization where they're pissing off the IMF for legalizing Bitcoin. And then flip side, Russia and Iran legalizing Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies for cross-border payments. And then the other thing that I wanted to add is there's talks of Q2 2023 as being the ending of the XRP case. And then I know that XRP, XRP Ripple has signed some sort of partnership agreement with the uh, World Economic Forum as well. And I'm yeah. not sure. I think I had heard something about, now I heard this Brad, about a year Brad and Garlinghouse ago. is already on the chair. Like he's that's, already on the board. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you could go look at it like if anyone could go look that up. He's on the board. Chainlink, I was told year, a couple like a year and a half ago, we're working on something with Swift. But I think I, I haven't looked into it, but I thought I heard something this morning about something more about that. So yeah. I don't know. I think Chainlink will be a category winner. Like if we're talking about what's going to make it through the flood. I think Chainlink for sure, because I was looking at the as an Oracle their partnerships. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're here to stay. Yeah, we and need that. We need that communication between blockchains. And another thing that helped me kind of solidify that that thesis was looking at the time frame of the pandemic and like when we saw their partnership with uh, Microsoft, that was wild. When I saw that partnership and what they were using Chainlink for, that blew my mind. If anyone who has positive feelings about crypto wants to come at me with like full force, all I need to do is talk about that connection with the technology patents that Chainlink was a part of with Microsoft. It is the most draconian nonsense yeah. <laughs> you could ever imagine. And it and it is tested. It's already out there live. I don't necessarily think it's going to be uh, part of the global conversation because we have different compliances across the board. You know, some people just aren't going to move forward with stuff like that. But people in poor countries of Africa, that's a different story. So I just pulled it up. Uh, again, we're recording this on the September 29th. Uh, Swift partners with Chainlink for cross-chain crypto transfer project. That's huge if that's real. In the past 24 hours. No, this is Cointelegraph. I mean, I knew that they were working on some stuff a year and a half ago, but this is yeah. legit. So yeah, and for I think me, Chainlink if I had to bank on Davos. Oh, okay. Polkadot Chainlink as well. and Polkadot, I think. Polk yeah, because there was a few crypto projects that were at at davos now uh, charles hoskinson somebody who's been to davos in the past but i think now he doesn't support the davos agenda and he refuses to attend this year <laughs> i've interviewed him i'm trying to get him back on so i can try to talk with him about some of these things yeah it'd but be I interesting it it'd be interesting to have that conversation with him about some of the things that i go over yeah if you're ever interested in doing some interviews i can try to you know help hook you up with something like that too yeah, I mean, my, I can't guarantee a Charles Hoskins in 100%, but I can. Yeah, do my no best. worries. I mean, for me, I'm really fascinated in this next transition phase because clearly they've laid out the carpet. It's like no, no feet have touched that carpet yet, only the elites. And so they're laying out the groundwork and like how it plays into our reality with what's going on. I mean, I just heard an update a couple of days ago about how um, Chase, JP Morgan Chase, is going to be creating their own payment processing system. 
you know how big that is? Like that is taking Visa and MasterCard and just like kicking them in the throat. Well, also, so you're I gonna, mean, if you look at Fed now too, I mean, all that exactly. kind of kicks PayPal and Venmo and Cash App in the throat too. And PayPal already started to kind of like do their, <laughs> I call these like the Shemitah moves because it always happens around this time frame. But like they started to create some new terms and conditions for business payments dealing with retail. I mean, dude, they are, this is obvious. We're about to watch one of the most historic moments in financial history unfold because this is an everything bubble. It's an yeah. everything bubble. The housing market is clearly topped out a while ago. They're, the banks are <laughs> the banks are thirsty for retail loans. Like they're thirsty to give people debt every and they time can't because the interest rates are going up. It's amazing to watch it all unfold because as an analyst who's been like emotionless about this past two years and just keeping my eyes on the prize of what I knew would come to fruition has really allowed me to to see it for f clearly before it happened. It was like a crystal ball. So what, whenever people reach out to me now and they're like, oh, Jordan, this thing happened. I'm like, yeah, and like that's what you should expect. Like this is what it is. It's fake and they implement these crashes to bring a reality to it. But when you have the most historic year of money printing ever in a single year, the Fed admitting to it, what did you expect once they started pulling away from injecting this fake stock market with fake money? Yeah. And when you take the housing market into consideration and the death of these fiat currencies and watching the rise of the of the DXY and you're hearing looming conversation about war. And I mean, this is a typical I mean, look setup. At the, the Chinese, uh, the Chinese uh, real estate market defaults, the wars, uh, yeah. just everything you put in combination, what's happening with the, the, the energy crisis, what's happening with fiat money because of the U S dollar. It's a mess, dude. I mean, um, like I said, we definitely got to do do this again. Yeah, um, I had an incredible time uh, chatting with you. Really, really uh, amazing collaboration. I hope this brought value to your community. And I hope that people, you know, from your channel that come over and check it out, find value in it as well. Um, Absolutely. You asked me so many great questions um, about some of the origins of my work and some of the some of the deeper, you know, like layers to to what's going on uh, with what I share. So I appreciate you for asking those those critical questions because they are important. Well, I appreciate you for answering them because it helps us all to kind of get a better insight about, you know, who you are and why you're doing what you're doing, which yeah, gives a, a lot of insight into why people do what they do. You know, and I could tell that you come from a good, good place with good intentions. And uh, that resonates with me. Yeah, maybe, I'm really I'm really grateful that uh, I'm grateful that Donut brought us together. I think this is definitely an important time for the cryptocurrency and financial uh, people that are on social media to come together and share their truth about what they're feeling because there there will be silencing of these sorts of opinions and you know I just want to let people know that Michael Burry wasn't the only guy to predict these moments, you know? Like there's a lot of us out there that are looking at this from a different set of eyes and have our own perspectives, so it's great to come together with people and 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 share this on different platforms. And when you when you can combine it because I mean even Madi Greenspan, he wasn't talking about Shemitah stuff before. So it's it's interesting to see how it's all these different things are starting to bleed over and it does make sense that we kind of come together to bring our perspectives together so that maybe we're missing something in the big picture and having these conversations can help with that. And then somebody watching might be able to actually connect some dots a as well. Million, so. A million percent. Like I always say, if you're doing well, I'm doing well. Yeah, I love it. I love it. All right, man. So here's what we need to do. I'm going to have links down below for everything we, that I shared uh, on today's video. I'm going to encourage people to go over and subscribe to your YouTube channel if they're not subscribed already. I want to encourage people to check out your Patreon channel. And I want to encourage people to go to your website and check out your courses. In review, do you mind kind of re-explaining what it is that you're doing, what you offer over there at Waters Above? Yeah, totally. So over on my Patreon, I have an entry level membership that anyone could uh, join at any time. It's giving people access to a weekly podcast I do. So people that are more interested in behind the scenes stuff that I am not able to cover in my YouTube videos, you not only get access to that podcast where I give a full market wrap up for the week and then I go over altcoins that um, the community votes on. So I've done about 70 
eight podcasts and I've covered four to five altcoins in every single episode, different ones. So it allows people to get, you know, a real good idea of how I analyze the charts and how I look at the market. And if they're interested in projects that, you know, are, are not normally covered, that's a great opportunity for them. And it also includes a um, access to our Discord server, a, com a private community Discord server, which is full of like minded people who are looking at the market from from this deeper layer. You know, we have a lot of decoders, we have astrologers, we have people that are interested in prepping, you know, people that are garden like into agriculture. I mean, I've really brought quite a quite a beautiful plethora of different people into this community through what I talk about in my work and my live streams and and in the crypto conversation. So yep, that's uh that's available um on patreon.com slash waters above. And then my website um is just where I have my courses. And um, it's a good you opportunity. Merch. You have merch, too. You could, we could shout out your merch. Yeah. Um, and another thing is anyone who joins my Patreon, they're getting a 20% discount on everything I do. So if they ever wanted a course or they wanted merch or anything like that, they would get the biggest discount available. I hook, hook up the Patreon supporters just for being supporters of my work. I really appreciate it. I'm really grateful for it. And my... Um, I actually have a sale going on in my courses until October 1st. So I don't know when this video will come out, but if anyone was interested in what I've been sharing today, whether that be technical analysis or the more esoteric stuff, um, it's a good opportunity. I'm thinking it's going to be coming out on October the 1st. When is the sale ending? So it's going to be ending probably like the cutoff of Eastern Standard Time, October 2nd. So I'll give people a full window. Okay, so they, they can have it till midnight Eastern Standard Time? Something like that. I'm not going to be super like on the clock about it. I'll probably just okay. the next day when I wake up. <laughs> yeah. Now, this, this will be going on my Patreon right afterwards. I always put unedited early access. Then I can edit it and put the edited version up on yeah. my YouTube channel. Yeah, I appreciate that. So the, the information on the sale is just watersabove.com slash sale. Nice and easy. And then at checkout, you use the promo code watersabove. All lowercase, all, all one word. Okay. Water's nice above, all lowercase, one word. Does it matter if they did uppercase? Would it not take it? Um, I don't know. I haven't tried, but it's just okay. all all lowercase, water's above, one word as the promo code, and then it's watersabove.com slash sale. Cool. And um, your merch page, if people want to check that out. And that's gonna yeah, be I designed all my own merch, and I designed all my courses. So everything that I do is 100% me. Did you design this little gold thing moving around? <laughs> no, no, that was something that I found though that I was really interested in uh, adding. I just thought it added an element of like uh, animation to to the site. No, it's so really it wasn't cool. boring. It's really cool. So it would be like, if you made it, man, can you make me something similar? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was something that I found. Um, yeah, I really, um, I really appreciate you having me on, and thanks for giving me the the platform and to talk about the the products and everything. It really means a lot to me. Yeah, man. Again, I mean, I mean, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. I figure it would it would be a good conversation. It's just you never know how people are going to connect, even if you kind of have an idea. Because totally. uh, one thing that I've learned is things don't always happen the way you expect them to happen. Sometimes they do. Generally, it doesn't happen that way. So if you could bear with me one second, I'm just going to go ahead and do the wrap up and stop recording. Absolutely. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for tuning in. I do appreciate you watching all the way to the very end. If you're not already subscribed and you're new to the channel, be sure to check out and explore my channel. Check out my playlist section. I would encourage you to hit the notification bell because sometimes YouTube will notify you when my videos come out. Sometimes, not always, and that's a problem. So if you, if you are subscribed and you do have the notification bell turned on and you're not getting notifications, I suggest that you unsubscribe, resubscribe, and turn your notifications on again and see if that works. I'm going to leave you with this. I encourage you to be a blessing to others, to treat people how you want to be treated, to be the glitch you want to see in the matrix, to be the change you want to see in the world. Practice change. <laughs>